Well, for analysis of the Ukrainian president's statements, let's talk to world affairs journalist Neil Clark, who joins us live. Neil, good to see you there. Thank you very much for your time, as always. Um, let's talk about these statements then, because federalization has been put forward as a possible solution uh, to the crisis, even by Kiev's Western supporters. But Poroshenko is uh, rejecting this as a possibility. Why do you think that is? Well, he is, isn't he? And I think that, uh, to be quite honest, uh, when the uh, leaders of the coup took power in Ukraine back in uh, February, had they really wanted to uh, bring the people of the East with them, uh, then they would have uh, offered federalization then, or at least sizable autonomy. But they did absolutely the opposite. They uh, deliberately set out to provoke the people in the East. Remember, one of the first things they did was change the Russian, uh, uh, the Russian uh, language law, having its official uh, second language status in the East. Uh, they then appointed two billionaire oligarchs to govern eastern provinces, and they also reversed the ban on Nazi uh, insignia. So they did everything to actually alienate people in the east and provoke the present crisis. And it's a bit rich now for Poroshenko to come out talking about special status. Had this was uh, had this uh, been announced earlier on, back in February, then 2,000 people's lives would have been saved. Perhaps 100,000 people are refugees. And so I think that we've got to look very carefully at the motives of the Kiev authorities in doing this. It's quite clear that their military offensive didn't go well. That's why they signed up to this ceasefire. And the grave suspicion is that they're really using this in order to rearm and regroup to launch an offensive at a later date. That's the worry. Well, the Lugansk and Donetsk uh, republics, they're set to remain uh, regions within Ukraine. You've mentioned it there. We talk about this special status, yeah. as it's called. What could that mean? Well, we don't know yet, do we? And that's the problem. We haven't had many, uh, any detail on this. And Poroshenko has gone back on his word on several occasions. And I'm sure that nobody in the East will want to sign up to any deal when there, are, where there aren't more details. What will this special status mean? Will it still mean that they'll be governed by billionaire oligarchs appointed from Kiev? And it reminds me a bit of the situation in Ireland, actually, 100 years ago, when the British authorities tried to subdue the Irish nationalist cause by violence. Uh, there was a war of independence going on in Ireland. And the British used irregular forces called the Black and Tans, who, who committed tremendous, uh, terrible atrocities. And, of course, this made the Irish uh, uh, more, more uh, hostile to any ideas of actually uh, staying within the British Empire. And uh, even though a treaty was, peace treaty was signed with the British, like this ceasefire now, there was division in the Irish camp. And eventually, of course, Ireland broke away because... Uh, people by then were so uh, uh, angered by the violence that was used against them that it, that it made them more militant. And I think this is what we're seeing in the east of Ukraine. This measure might have been enough back in February, uh, calling for special status uh, when the coup took place. But it's not enough now, I'm, I don't think, because the people in the east are quite, you know, are actually more hostile to Kiev, obviously, than they were back in February, because 2,000 people have died, their homes have been shelled, people have been made refugees, and understandably, uh, many people in the East do not want to stay part of a Ukraine led by Poroshenko uh, 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 when the Ukrainian government has committed so many crimes against them. And briefly, what is your situation of, uh, what your reading of the situation on the ground? There are reports that the Ukrainian army is, is massing there, but Poroshenko yeah. says it's not for an offensive. Mm. What's your interpretation of, of the ceasefire and how it's holding and, and the situation on the ground? Well, of course, he's bound to say it's not for an offensive. The suspicion I've had is that this ceasefire, and I, and I hope I'm proved wrong, to be honest, because obviously we want to see an end to hostilities. This is the, but the suspicion I've got, Paul, is that this is being used tactically by the Ukrainian authorities to rearm and regroup. The war wasn't going well for them and that they will launch a offensive at a later date. The problem we've got here is that the hawks in Washington don't want this crisis to be solved. That's the basic problem. And they want to keep this going as an order for uh, uh, as an excuse for NATO expansionism and an excuse for more sanctions to be imposed on Russia. Because if there is peace, then it's very hard to justify uh, sanctions on Russia. What would be the pretext? So there are some, you know, the serial warmongers, we can call them, the war party in Washington want to keep this going. And that's the big the big problem, and that, that, and that, I think, is the big concern for all of us who actually want to see a peaceful solution to this conflict, obviously. World Affairs journalist Neil Clark, thank you very much for your time here on RT International. Thanks, Paul.